Hi, welcome back to 5-Minute Physics. Today is the third in my installments about why is physics so simple. And this is perhaps the most ambitious one because I'm going to explain how the fact that physics is so simple and using that fact uh, has caused two sets of people to win Nobel Prizes. Okay, this aspect of simplicity is related to a fundamental simplicity of nature in that there are only three independent quantities that have what are called dimensions. Namely, there's length, time, and mass. That's what we mean by dimensions, not like x, y, and z. Length, time, and mass. And we call those dimensional quantities, actually, I should say, some people say charge is another one, but it, we won't include it here. It's kind of irrelevant for this discussion. But those are the fundamental dimensions of nature in the sense that every physical quantity can be described in terms of those dimensions by the units they have. For example, velocity is length over time meters per second, miles per hour. You can use the units you want, but it's, it's, it's equal to, it has the dimensions, as we say, of length over time. Acceleration, which is the rate of change of velocity, is length over time over time, so it's length over time squared. Force, which is, you may remember from Newton, F equals ma, force is mass times acceleration, so force has units of mass times length over time squared. And every quantity in nature, every physical quantity that relates to a measurement has units of dimension. But because there are only three dimensions in nature, there are a finite number of independent quantities you can make out of those three dimensions, out of mass, length, and time. And that means there are a finite number of relationships between physical quantities. So the fact that there are only three dimensions in nature tells us that there are really only a finite number of fundamental laws, if you wish, that connect one quantity and another. And that simplifies physics. It means that, that we know that basically there are relationships between every physical quantity and they can't be too complicated because they're all given in terms of mass, length, and time. Now, one could go in uh, on a lot longer on that particular topic, but I'm not gonna go there. We could, we could spend a lot of time showing how you could derive interesting equations using dimensional, what are, what's called dimensional analysis, and how you can check your work using dimensional analysis. That's the kind of thing we normally do in physics classes. But I want to go somewhere else today. I want to point out that particle physicists in particular have re recognized an, something really important. That really, those three fundamental dimensions in nature, mass, length, and time, are not independent. For example, if there was a universal quantity in nature, a constant, some quantity that connected length and time, that was the same for all observers, then every time you used a length, you could express it equivalently in terms of time. And in fact, there is such a quantity. It's the speed of light. It's the same for all observers. It's the same universal quantity in nature. And therefore, I can use it to express every length in terms of a time. What do I mean by that? Well, the speed of light is about is 3 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second. So let's look at my arm. My arm is, say, 30 centimeters. I could say, what's the length of my arm? I could say a billionth of a second. And I, unambiguously, I know what that means. If, the length, if I express the length of my arm as a billionth of a second, that means it takes light a billionth of a second to traverse the length of my arm. And if I plug in the speed of light, I can find out what it is in, 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 in centimeters. I'll get 30 centimeters. And so every length now can be expressed as a time, and every time is a length once I use the speed of light. So that means now there are only two independent dimensions in nature, mass and either length or time. But there's another fundamental quantity in nature, another fundamental constant that relates now, at, in terms of energy and time. And that constant is Planck's constant. Planck's constant tells us the energy of a, a, of a, of a unit, of a photon of light of a given frequency. It says E equals H, where H is Planck's constant, times that fr frequency, which we call nu. E equals H nu. So it relates energy to frequency, but frequency is one over time, cycles per second. So Planck's constant relates anything with the units of energy to, to the units of one over time. Now remember that Einstein told us that E equals mc squared, so I can relate energy and mass. So basically what Planck's constant tell, gives us is a relationship between mass or energy and one over time. So now I can express every mass or energy in terms of a unit of time. 
Now we actually use E equals mc squared uh, uh, to relate mass and energy all the time in particle physics, and we actually express the mass of particles not in terms of kilograms, but in terms of their equivalent energy. So the mass of proton, which I think is something like 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, I don't even remember, but it's probably something like that. We normally express it in, in units called electron volts, which is a unit of energy, and we say that the mass of proton is a billion electron volts, a giga electron volt, and we say one GeV. And we always talk about the mass of an electron, even though that's the equivalent, a mass of an electron, sorry, the mass of a proton, mass of a proton is a GeV, an electron is 2,000 times lighter. So we say the mass of a proton is a billion electron volts, one GeV, and we talk in those terms. But now, because energy and, and time are related, I can say, I can relate every energy to an equivalent time by using Planck's constant. And the characteristic time that's associated with an energy of a billion electron volts, if you plug in Planck's constant and the speed of light, turns out to be 10 to the minus 24 seconds. That's a million billion billionth of a second, a very short time. That's the characteristic time associated with that mass. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it implies that it's a characteristic scale of any events, of any physical processes that happen for particles that are 1 GeV on that. If you're looking at nature on that scale of those elementary particles, you would expect the processes to take place on an order 10 to the minus 24 seconds. And if you looked at uh, 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 the processes associated with, a, with, with something that had a much uh, uh, smaller mass, it turns out that time scale is much longer. But for, for proton scale physics, you expect 10 to the minus 24 seconds to describe the phenomenon. If you want to build accelerators, you have to be able to probe things on that kind of time scale, which is quite ambitious. Now, this all says to us, if some event, if some process is going to happen to the proton or, or a particle of mass like the proton, you'd expect it to take place on some order of 20, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. In particular, if a particle like uh, the mass of a proton was going to decay, you might expect it to decay in some multiple of 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Now, if it decayed in a much longer time scale, there must be some physical parameter in, the, in, in governing the physics that's a very small number, so that the particle lives much longer than its kind of natural lifetime. All of this became relevant in 1974, when two groups of experimentalists were, were we're banging, we're at, at accelerators with electrons, banging them in, in um, uh, go around in, in, in an accelerator, banging them together, either in a circle or in a straight line, banging them together to try and, um, either they're coming that way or going in a circle around and colliding with each other, to try and look for new elementary particles in nature. And the signature of that was that if the two, if, uh, if the two particles collided, and they create a new particle, you'd see what's called a resonance. You'd see a lot more events at a certain energy. So you'd look at the events as a function of energy. In fact, I'll draw it here because I'm going to use this in a second. You'd look at the, at the events as a function of energy, and if you suddenly saw a peak at a certain energy, then you, this would tell you that you discovered a new particle, and the energy associated with the peak would be the mass that we related to the mass of the particle by E equals mc squared. Now there's one other factor in nature that you have to uh, know about, and that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It turns out the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a principle of quantum mechanics that says we can never measure, uh, for two different sets of quantities, for different pairs of quantities, you can never measure them both perfectly at the same time. Like you can't measure the position of a particle and know uh, it's momentum at the same time. There's always some uncertainty. Another pair that it turns out to, for which there's a Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is it says there's an uncertainty in the energy that you measure, and the product of that times, times the uncertainty in the time in which you make that measurement is always bigger than something like Planck's constant. This says that you can never know, you can never measure energy if you have a certain amount of time to measure something, you can never measure the energy exactly. If you want to measure the energy very, very well, you have to measure the system over a very long time. Now, what if a particle has a finite lifetime? Well, then you can only measure the mass of that particle over its lifetime. And what that means is, if a particle has a very short lifetime, 
then if you look at this and you produce it, it turns out that the peak has a very broad width. Because basically, since you only have a finite amount of time to measure it, then it's, there's an uncertainty in its energy. And if you try and measure it, in fact, it turns out the experiments tell you there's an uncertainty in its energy. If it's a very short-lived particle, then the peak is very, I mean, it, it, sorry, very long-lived particle, then the peak is never very narrow because you have a very long time to measure it. Now, here's what happened in 1974. Two sets of experimentalists discovered a new elementary particle in nature of a mass about three times the mass of the proton. I'll we'll have to write that down. What they discovered, however, was that they expected the particle to have a width in energy that was characteristic of a, of a lifetime of 10 to the minus 24 seconds or so, because that's the characteristic lifetime of particles of that new particles that have mass of order the, the mass of the proton. But what they discovered was the particle had a mass, had a, had a lifetime that was about three, about, about a thousand times longer than they expected. The peak was almost a thousand times narrower than they expected. As one of the experiments has said, it's like going into the jungle to discovering a species of humans that live for 100,000 years instead of 100 years. This was so exotic and so unexpected by dimensional analysis that they, in fact, had discovered something fundamental new about, something new about nature that was happening on the scale of the proton. And they won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. Now, if you hadn't used dimensional analysis, that discovery of a narrow peak wouldn't have meant anything. But because we understood that this defied the conventional wisdom about how long particles should live, it meant they discovered something fundamentally new that needed to be understood. Now, it turned out in 1972, three physicists had discovered that the property of the strong interactions between quarks has that, that, inter, that strong attraction has an amazing property. If the particles get closer together, then the force gets weaker. And for more massive particles, the quarks are hanging around closer together. And you could predict, in fact, that if it was the strong interaction that was governing um, the, the processes related to this brand new particle, that this weird new property of the strong interaction they called asymptotic freedom could, could produce a very small number related to that interaction, and that small number could explain why the particle lived much longer. Now, there's a lot more work that had needed to be done over the next 20 years to prove that the force between quarks became weaker as the four quarks became closer. But that property of asymptotic freedom, which explained the discovery in 1974, eventually was discovered to be a central property of the strong interaction, one of the four forces of nature, and those physicists won a Nobel Prize. Now, the whole point is that none of this would have been so surprising and unexpected if we hadn't used dimensional analysis. So that very simple property of nature that allows us to say, basically, there's only one independent dimension in nature, gives us expectations. When we make, do experiments and they defy those expectations, it tells us there's something interesting. And so dimensional analysis is a guide for new physics, as well as explaining why nature is so simple. This five-minute video took a lot longer because it was a little more complex. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Take care.